Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. I'm Gil Gross, host of Monday Match Analysis with outstanding tennis journalists Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. The 2020 season is over, sadly, uh, but we will continue to roll on with these podcasts. On today's show, we talk about Federer, excuse me, not Federer, we talk about the other two, Nadal and Djokovic going out in the semifinals at the ATP Finals and uh, talk about is this a changing of the guard? Normally, you don't see both Dominic Team and Daniil Medvedev, two players in the same tournament, both went through both Djokovic and Nadal. I'm not sure that's ever happened before. And we'll finish today's show with some thoughts on 2020 from Rafa and Nole's perspective. But Amy, let's get started with this first semifinal match. Djokovic team, team has beaten Novak. Um, He's five and two since 2017 against Djokovic. That's pretty, that's some track record. And he almost beat him at this year's Australian Open, but Novak held him off. Um, As I said in the last podcast, I think that anyone who's going to play team and Medvedev, they're going to need to double down on their homework efforts. And one of the things that we talked about in the last podcast is Dominic's forehand versus his backhand. And I kind of teased on Twitter that I had a little beef with the way that Novak handled team. And I I did not chart the match. I would like to do that in the off season, but just by eyeballing it, I can tell that his strategy was sort of a very 2015 strategy to go backhand, 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 backhand. And, you know, on on another surface that may work for a one-handed backhander. Um, If, you know, if you can get the ball high to a one-handed backhand, that's very painful, but Um, On this surface, it was, as we talked about, low and slow. And um, there were points when Novak just hammered Dami's backhand and it was not working. Um, He used a lot of slice to neutralize and he, the, the thing just didn't break down. So my point, Gil, was you need to go to the guy, to Dominic's forehand. And if you actually chart the matches and dig out where the errors are. That's what you'll find. And that's what happened today against Medvedev. The errors came on the forehand side. Joel, do you agree? Well, I think it is interesting that we talked about this, about the role of the forehand. The forehand is a a ground stroke that breaks down in rallies and a backhand that you want to approach against to make people hit backhand passing shots from a little off the center of the court. Novak yesterday, I mean, look, he's up 4-0 in the third set tiebreaker. I mean, that's a pretty significant lead and it kind of got away from it. I, I like the point you made, Amy, about how he played kind of a, a 2015 game plan. He's not gonna he's not gonna get the ball high up on the one hander with his with his two hander. You know, it's not the Rafa Topson forehand. It's the driving right. backhand. But more or less the Djokovic two hander breaks down its share of one handers as it has with Roger. I mean the you'll take the Novak two hander against most one handers, but team he, 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 he redirects, but when we think of redirection, we often think of it as taking pace off the ball sometimes. He redirects and then accelerates, and then he can go back down the line. He's even, as, as we've seen, even a little sometimes even side spin on the one-hander down the line. Other times he drives it. And also, I think there's something about team. I covered it yesterday for Tennis.com, and I said how he, um, he's the student. He studied the three geniuses. And he's their lead student. And you can see the things he's kind of picked up and realized that he needs to do is court positioning Mm -hmm. and driving the backhand and going after the forehand, all these things. It's kind of like the the next gen of what he, of what needs, what it needs to be to solve the question of those top three. And he um, Mm -hmm. he came up with some big shots. And the thing I like, and this, this is going to get into some of the um, further exploration, Gil and I, Gil, you and I are going to talk about the tennis. You can see on big points, team doesn't think to himself, don't miss. Team mm-hmm. thinks to himself, I've been taught to hit the ball a certain way. Hit the shot I've been taught to hit and go after it. And you see in that third set tie break, he, um, uh, once he got to about 4-3, that okay, now I'm in this. And he started just lashing it. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't hitting crazy shots. He was, he was, they worked, but there were shots that he knows how to hit, like that cross-court topspin backhands and 
all of that. Oh yeah. I, in big points team is if anything, raising the aggression, raising the energy and the racket acceleration. And that's, what's been so impressive in big moments for, for Dominic. And he's won so many big tie breaks uh, in 2020 Medvedev in the U S open semifinals twice this week, even the Australian semis when he beat Nadal in three straight tie breaks. I also agree with your critique, Amy. I think if you look how, how Medvedev played team, it was constantly changing direction on the backhand to put him on the run, make him hit a running forehand. Team's mm-hmm. backhand is so, so uh, vastly improved from what it's been in past years. Uh, and when he mixes up the slice and the bullet hitting over it and has that variation backhand to backhand, he can play with Djokovic and do way more damage. But don't you think it was kind of a passive game plan overall from Novak? I don't really think he was taking his risks. Well, yeah. Um, and and to add to that, I mean, you're not really talking about team's backhand. You're talking about what he does on that wing, the various reactions and shots. And he can slice. He can um, drive the ball. He can take it on the rise. He can also just blunt it back. Um, as he does on the forehand as well, but uh, he, he can just sort of pop it or not not even really a chip, just sort of meet the, the racket with the ball using whatever pace is coming at him to neutralize. So I what I see is a lot, you guys are seeing the offense. I'm seeing a ton of great defense on that Agreed. wing. Um, but a, as for Novak, um, Gil, every time Novak says, okay, I'm just going to go to the backhand, I'm going to go to the backhand, I'm going to go to the backhand, and he's waiting for that perfect short ball to pull the trigger and change direction or do whatever he's going to do, take a more offensive shot. Every time he passes up the opportunity for offense, you're right, the game plan becomes more passive overall. And um, in that match, I saw multiple opportunities for uh, Djokovic to run around and hit forehand instead of continuing in a backhand to backhand rally. You know, a couple years ago, he was really getting into doing that. And now I'm seeing him get away from that again. So um, he needs to retool, look at a bunch of videotape, get with his coaches and um, really look at what these younger guys are doing. Yeah, I just don't think Novak is quite as comfortable coming up to net. And I think he, again, he passes up certain shots to do that. Even in that tie break, there's a transition. He tries this backhand slice approach and he netted. It. And you can see he's just still has a little bit of what I think of that baseline mentality. It's like, I want to come in on something super good and have a makeable volley. I don't want to play a tumbling volley. He's played his share. I mean, he's a great player, of course. But I just, like I said the other day on our show, um, when Novak sometimes has, has a certain kind of volley or an overhead, it's like, okay, easy, steady. And he's just uh-huh. not quite. And, and again, getting passed by team, it's only one point, but boy, it just feels like a laser. I mean, some of these passing shots that some like team hits that you've seen against other people. So Novak, it, it compels him to either overhit the approach shot or back off from coming to net and just feeling not quite as balanced. I mean, he's so balanced. And again, this coming to net thing, Revolves around sometimes you've got to surrender the balance. You've got to be like a Becker or a Rafter mm. and you're kind of tumbling out of control mm. a little bit. And I don't think yeah. Novak always likes that. And now he's seeing here's team who's a who's a next generation. And then to get back to your point about team and his foreign, I'd submit that Medvedev, if not as pure a great back as Novak's, a certain adaptability that allows him to hit like, okay, I'm gonna slice it down the line. It's kind of a hack shot, mm-hmm. but it kind of worked for him well the first set kind of combines what both of you guys are saying because at five all novak approaches team's backhand on three separate occasions or you know what i think he approached the forehand once and then hit a volley to the backhand side but team hit three backhand passing shots all of them were dipped low at novak's feet but novak lost all three points he missed two of the volleys and he popped one up that team got to and easily put away joel I mean, a lot of the, the volleyers, the great volleyers of the 70s certainly would have won one of those points with the volleys that Djokovic had to look at, right? Well, that's, I, I would say that, yes, I remember the points. Well, yeah, it was a whole 
different gestalt of volume and the frequency of the shot and all the all the volleys people play then you can see Novak it's like it's almost like he has a a finite amount of volleys in his pocket that he brings out with every match it might be it might be 50 but it's finite it's almost like he thinks like okay I used one up I used one up. I used one up. yeah and, but, and but this can be remedied Yes, um, the, the, you look at the guy's form on the volley. It's picture perfect. I yes. think you make an amazing point when you say on the volley, this actually helps me in my game. You've got to surrender. Like you don't have to hit the perfect shot and then be perfectly on balance when you're done. And maybe somewhere inside him, the perfectionist inside him is holding on to that. That's interesting. I love it. But all well, he has to do is is get to Monte Carlo Country Club in the off season, drill that bad boy and just work on it. He'll get it. Yeah. That seems to me a, a more sustainable way to finish points quickly. If you know if compared to let's say the backhand drop shot, which he's used with more frequency. Mm -hmm. It feels like improving the transition. Oh, game. I, I'm just so over the drop shot with Novak. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's let like, we're getting older now. Let's move to the next level. Yeah. And and just to clarify, I, I say the great volleys of the 70s. I think even Nadal would have um, handled that those three volleys better and not been broken at five all. Uh, let's go to Nadal's match. He lost uh, three sets to Neil Medvedev first time. Medvedev got the better of Rafa. Felt that Nadal had, well, he certainly had his chances. He served for the match in the second set, uh, but he he faded in the third after losing that opportunity and really broken at love. Uh, so, man, that was uh, a tough pill to swallow because Nadal was going for his first ATP final. But uh, what did what did you feel was the main difference in that matching? Well, it's interesting because I listened to our last podcast like three times and Joel, who's like right 99.99999% of the time, made an interesting comment, something about you don't see Nadal like narrowly lose a set, like the first set, um, and then just peter out in the next set. And that's exactly what and it wasn't the first set that he narrowly lost. It was the second set. And then he just petered out in the third set. And if you listen to his or read his uh, post-match comments, he's like, yeah, I should have had it. I should have had it. And, and then he just doesn't even talk about the third set. It's very un -Rafa like That is interesting. Well, I, when I, I remember we were talking about that. Of course, I mean, it has to do with his attitude, too. It's not, I mean, I'm not talking, I mean, he's lost his share of matches after. Yeah, that, of course. That, but, I, but, I, but you're right. He did. It seemed in that third set and you're right, Amy, that he kind of, it's like, how'd that happen? I'm yeah. Rafa and I fought for it. Well, and I think there's something, there's something about Medvedev and we'll be able to talk about these guys more as contenders. Medvedev has a kind of, he has a trance. He can put you in a kind of a trance because the way uh -huh. he plays, it's, it's a little different. Novak, Novak doesn't do that to you. Novak just kind of, brilliantly goes after you pound depth 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 here 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 and you just kind of feel kind of pounded medvedev has this thing well how do you win that point and what did that happen and how yeah. and he comes up with these things yeah and I think very yeah. unsettling i mean he's a real he's a very everyone is disruptive but he's exceptionally disruptive and i think it left nadal by that third set kind of kind of confused kind of how am i going to get a hold of this guy what am i going to do to get him off his game. And the same thing had happened, of course, in that great US Open final in 2019 that Nadal barely got out of that match. But I think there's these things that Medvedev does that are just kind of like, what was that? And here's the big serve and here's the sudden attack. And he, he makes it, he's a very good improvisational player. Yeah. And, and you're so right. And I think that left Nadal kind of a little, a little stymied. And again, that third set lacked some energy and it just kind of the, the, the air went out of the balloon. He's the mad scientist. He's so unpredictable. You, you don't know. He just tries stuff at the craziest moments, like the sneak in in the third set on a break point. Nadal kept going to the backhand slice. And for the first time all match, Medvedev saw that Nadal was going to slice it. So charged in and finished a volley. That's so disconcerting when your yeah. opponent tries new tactics on the biggest points of the match. Well, this is yeah. the thing we talked to. I talked about this before when we were talking about how Nadal when he beat Schwartzman in the semis of the French Open. And this is the developmental piece, which is broaden the arsenal, practice your surprises. Practice mm -hmm. your surprises. In other mm -hmm. words, don't, you know, 
I would guarantee, I'm certain that Ned has has practiced that. So I think it doesn't mean doesn't mean you have to trot it out early, or you know it's just interesting. And what that does, and Nadal is usually you know Nadal has had his share of surprises, his sudden serve volley, and I think that kind of it doesn't just win you one point when you do that. It wins you ten more points because now you've put your opponent. Whoa, what 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 next might happen? Now you're not playing by the pattern, and I think in a way I think that's sort of what. Um, to get back to why Novak lost versus team. That's why Novak may have lost that match because he, you know, the patterns work pretty well when you're a top three player. Usually you don't have to be the one adjusting, but suddenly here comes. And so maybe that segues into our whole topic of what, what's shifting in the landscape of tennis. Well, that's what a good football team will do. They'll practice the sneak attacks like um, the random onside kick or the flea flicker. They practice that over and over and over and over again. And if maybe that's what Medvedev is doing. Um, but I agree with you guys. It's like Joel said in the previous podcast, he has a parks and rec quality to him. And then he has like an accountant quality to him. And then his facial expressions between points are one of amused disdain. And then, you know, all of a sudden you think it's a baseline game and then you got a six, six guy charging into the net, just putting the ball away like a freight train. So he, he's a, he's a very interesting player. Um, I really enjoyed in the match that he just played against team. I really enjoyed how after dropping the first set, he did mix it up by coming into the net. And, um, you know, I know this is a show about the big three, but I've, I've got to ask you, this is like top of mind for me. I've got to ask you guys. Um, There was a point in the second set. I know, you know, the one I'm talking about against team, and um, team had break point. It was 3-3, I believe. And Daniil hit a pretty weak uh, serve, second serve. It might have been like 83 miles an hour. They end mm-hmm. up face-to-face at the net. Gil's nodding. And um, team has all the time in the world. The ball's right in front of him. It bounces right in front of him. They're both at the net. And what's the play there, guys, for you? What's the play? I would hit the guy in the right hip. Gil? I'd hit the guy in the right armpit. <laughs> and I would I would hit the guy in the feet. And and what did he do? What did Dominic do? He went for the sideline. Yeah. Nobody talked about that on the telecast. And I'm like, this is the elephant in the room. Like, <laughs> they, they have a fine bromance or something. He didn't go right at him. And if he did he would have broken him and that might have been match right there. Let's, there you go. There's tennis. That's, that's, that's how it happens sometimes. Right. One minute. Yeah, I had to get that out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean oh. that, that, that three all game is going to be nightmarish for team when he goes to bed tonight. Cause he had yeah. all his opportunities. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask it. Did Nadal slice too much against Medvedev? Always a tough thing to determine. Maybe. Maybe if he wins, if he wins the match, he doesn't seem like he sliced too much, but maybe I think, yeah, I think Medvedev got onto that. Medvedev got onto that. And then when he comes to net against it, that's the whole thing. That's why the whole thing, like when you see the slice and the squash shot, the net rushers see all that stuff is like, wow, that's heaven. Thank you so much for mm-hmm. slicing the ball so I can hit a volley. But maybe Nadal relied on that a little too much. I mean, you know, it's so, he lost, so maybe he did. But I don't know, I, you know, I guess. I well, mean, Gil, what do you do when somebody hits the, a lot of slice to you and the ball comes in low? What do you do with that? Um, I generally slice back. Medvedev, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think Med- that's what both the guys were doing. Um, Nadal and team today were using a ton of slice against Medvedev. Well, it's a good play against him. I think everyone on tour slices more against Medvedev because their coaches tell them to. Uh, I, I didn't think Nadal sliced too much because I think it set up the shots that he was looking for. Um, and I just think that the forehand down the line and the volleys in the third set, the, the things that those kinds of tactics are intended to set up, I, I just felt Nadal's execution was missing on the back end. Well, that's right. So the question with these things is like, then you can find some stat that says, how much did he slice? Was that too much? But to me, the metric in tennis remains the scoring system. You know, the metric in tennis remains the execution at the key stages. So I'm not really, 
I'm not really going to look at a stat and say, oh, well, he sliced, you know, X percent and maybe he should have sliced less. No, what he needed to do is execute. But then if Medvedev is handling it fine and it's not really attaining much purchase for Nadal, then it's fine. Then it, that, that, that's the thing with neutralizing tactics. They're neutral, neutralizing tactics. They're neutralizing. They're not offensing. You know, Nadal slice yeah. meant to set up his forehand and do things. But Med, Medvedev, again, we talked to, to get back to Medvedev and how team made this decision, which was he made a strange decision on a big point. Nadal slicing again. I think Medvedev creates this whole little tactical vibe. It's like a creates. A, if you look at the court as a series of roads and patterns, he creates these traffic jams, and it gets into a player's head. Even someone like Nadal or team, it makes them see start thinking differently, mm-hmm. and so it gets them a little off kilter. When you play someone like that, I, I know that because I've played plenty of people like that, and I am kind of a player like that. You get people; it's not predictable. So now it, everyone's a little everyone's a little out of sorts. I'm not quite controlling things the way I should. And so the instinct, which is right, short ball, hit right at guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, I'm going to go for the sideline. You, 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 you overthink it. You know, you get you make odd decisions. We've all done that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that description of Medvedev. Um, and I, I, it showed in, in uh, Dominic's demeanor starting in the second set. He started hitting himself with the racket and yelling and staring at his box. And yeah. Um, well, Medvedev listens to that. Medvedev listens to that. How can I lose to this guy? What is going on here? Yeah. Uh, but Gil, to your point about the slice, um, I like something that Ash Barty told me once in a press conference. Um, and that is, you know, she's known for her slice. And that is that she uses it as a way to place her opponent on the court where she wants. So when we think of slice with these guys, we're thinking of like a backhand to backhand rally where they're just slicing to the backhand with each other, slice wars, the backhand to the backhand. Why well, for, for Nadal, it would be down the line to the, right. to the Medvedev backhand. Oh, right. well, that's true. That's true. Um, but why not use the slice a little more creatively, like slice to one end of the court and then to the other end of the court, slice short angle cross, you know, slice this, that, and the other, instead of just these, um, you know, cross court sort of ways. So I would like to see that shot used more um, strategically, I guess, and and not as a, a neutralizing shot. Now I know I now I know once again why I'm the oldest person on this show. I mean, my the slice is the slice. I, I do that all the That's time. That's all you do. No, I I, I have the <laughs> I have a, I have my little flat tops and back end, but I understand the complete deployment of it because in the net rushing era, not just as an approach shot, but Barty's point is great. I want to put you there, so you're going to hit this there, mm-hmm. and I can disguise this there, and then I can drop approach you. I can angle you. Mm-hmm. I can load your western forehand, knowing you're going to hit kind of short. And again, remember these guys, these guys, two of our big three are predominantly baseliners, are significantly baseliners. Nadal and Djokovic are mm-hmm. by and large mostly baseliners. Roger's sort of different, and he's and even he has gained most of his success as a baseliner. So to get back to how people can play, particularly people who who, you know, recreational people, by all means, and the slice gets some bad language, it gets some uh some low respect is, oh, it's neutral. Oh, it's defense. No, it's, it can be totally used for offense. And the way you explain the Barty answer, Amy, is perfect. Yeah, I want to put you there and I'm going to make you hit a low ball there. And it's not just the short one. It's deep. It's low. It's disguise. It's down the line. It's cross court. It's a return. It's a great many things. It's a, it's a great many things. It's, it's through the middle. It's a lot of ways it can be, be used to redirect a rally so it can go Something can go back cross court the other way. So again, uh, yeah, the slice back in, and I don't think, I don't think any of our three uses it in the complete way it could be used. Even Feder, it's mostly the short one now that he hits. He doesn't hit a deep slice. I cannot just, you know, to throw in, I cannot wait until we're talking about Federer again. Yeah. You know, like, and that's going to be soon, guys. I'm really excited yes. about it. Can yeah, I, uh, I think this will be interesting. I wasn't planning on going here, but here's um, kind of how I was taught to think about tennis in general terms when it comes to variety, mm-hmm. uh, which is that 
tennis is a game where you're trying to break your opponent's contact point. And that means you can, uh, you can add height, you can take away height, you can add pace, you can take away pace, you can add depth, you can take away depth. So just as much as a big heavy forehand with tons of topspin might add height because it kicks up off the court, inject pace and, you know, be hit with, with great depth. In the same way, a slice takes all of those things away, but the result is the same that you're not getting your comfortable shot between hip and shoulder uh, like you'd like. Like pitching and hitting. Exactly. Pitching and hitting. And that's exactly right. And now the thing is that the slice in the Western grip two-handed era kind of became a little more shoved into the back closet because it's not, it's not, as, it's not as commonly implemented as in my, you know, my, in my day, people were continental and Eastern and one-handed backhands. And so it had its, it, it, it was more, it was more of a marquee player. Now it's like you're, 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 oh yeah, my uncle, he's got one of those. Yeah. And so it's yeah. not, <laughs> seen as a, it's not as seen as a lead character, but it absolutely is. And I don't, I mean, and it can be used that way. You're right. It's how do we, how do you break up a contact point? The, the slice has limits for things like the passing shot. I mean, the, that's, that's a big limit for it, but for a lot of other things, it's got a lot of value, a lot of staying on balance. And again, it's a, and, and, and the variation of the slice, but again, it's not, um, it's not always taught. A lot of people with two handers, you know, they don't really learn. They don't learn how to hit it. They're not taught how to properly hit it. And then, and then their concept of it is like, or they'll say things like, Oh yeah, I'll junk it up sometimes. Well, when you use a term like that, yeah, you're denigrating it. Yeah, you're right. You're I'm going to stop it. using the word junk. No slice slander here. Come on. That's right. <laughs> that is right. Except no. I'll, I'll use it when the shot truly is junk. And you guys yeah. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I do know what you're talking about because I, um, I have it. I've hit my share. But I mean, in other words, but you see what I mean? It's kind of like how the language is subtly used. Oh, yeah, that person beat me with all that junk. It's like, well, no, they, they hit the ball over the court more. <laughs> they disrupted your... Exactly, it disrupted your contact point. Yeah, it broke up was your game. A, was this a changing of the guard, Amy? This tournament? No, <laughs> I'm gonna come right out because there was a lot of, you know, I think you used the term Gill recency bias, or somebody used it on. I on uh, it, it just we in tennis and and in the world too. Um, we, we have this thing, I don't know if it's the smartphones and the devices, but we're all about what just happened. And we amplify what just happened. Um, I Look, these are a best of three. These are, have been best of three tournaments here at the end of the year. Um, slams are best of five. Uh, Novak, even though that we had this long break in 2020, really the past few months, he's been quite busy because he played, you know, two slams in a row and then these other tournaments, he's gotta be pretty tired. So, um, and, li and like Joel reminds us, he had COVID. So um, no, I don't put too much stock in this. And I wanna remind our listeners that there's a whole bunch of people out there that don't even know this tournament exists and they are tennis fans. But if you said to them, um, you know, Rafa lost to Medvedev in the ATP finals, they'd be like, what's that? You know, so it, no, it's it's not really indicative of anything. And let's not do the recency bias thing. And let's wait and see what 2021 brings. Well, I feel that if there's a changing of the guard happening, it is happening in slow motion. And I would I would say it, it certainly is happening. But no one event signals a changing of the guard. And, and you mentioned it, this format is not similar to a major. The time of year matters for motivation. And mm -hmm. it's not a new development that a, a Dominic team or a Daniil Medvedev can beat these guys. They have before. Medvedev hadn't beaten Nadal, but he showed that he could. So the fact that it happened in the same tournament, that's just math, probability. It, it can happen. You know, it's so interesting, these year-end events, how they work. I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about how do we evaluate these tournaments? Are they, is it the Super Bowl where it gets decided? Is it the All-Star Game where we just see a lot of great showcase of skills like we see particularly in the round robin? And is it also occasionally kind of maybe the shape of what could come? 
just like last year when Tsitsipas won it or 40 years ago when John McEnroe was a teenager and he won it. So might we be seeing something? The change of the guard is always incremental. It's never drastic. It's never revolutionary. It's always kind of evolutionary. And so we saw, yeah, definitely with these two guys, it was kind of neat. It was neat that whole, like a special nugget. They each beat Djokovic and Nadal. That's pretty, it's the only tournament where that can happen short, short of the ATP Cup. So that's kind of neat, but it's just maybe a speck of white, what might come, but we don't know. And we've had that happen before. I mean, Dimitrov won it a few years ago. Oh, he's going to step up. Well, he hasn't. So we'll see. It makes these tournaments fun to watch and also to compress our way. I know, Gil, you watched just about every live match and to see this quality tennis was, was fun to see. Right. Well, would you agree, though, that it's like it happens slowly? So going into Australian Open 2021, I give the teams and the Medvedevs and even the Zverevs of the world and Tsitsipas, I give them all a better chance than I did in 2020. But that's Absolutely. not because of what happened at the ATP finals. That's because of what has been happening for the last two years now. And they're, they're just getting better. Well, it's well, not only that it is happening slowly, but it also might not be V-shaped. So it might be like getting better, getting worse, getting better, getting worse, getting better, like that. So just because the changing of the guard is happening doesn't mean it's happening all in one shot. Yeah. Agreed. Right. And we're all, God, we're all about uh, curve watching these days in our world, aren't we? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, well, 2020 season is over. It's time for uh, off-season reflection. You go back to the drawing board. You, uh, and in Djokovic's case, you you think hard about what you want to be spending your time doing in Monte Carlo. Uh, for Nadal, it's Mallorca. Federer's in Switzerland. Um, although, let's keep it to the players who who we've been watching carefully on the court over the course of uh, the last season. Um, Joel, what do you think the the final kind of final term feedback is? You're their professor. They've just completed the first uh, the, the two semesters, which but was broken up, oddly enough. Yeah, there's uh, a deep a long, that was a long spring, but and not in a good way either, right? I mean, we had a long no. gap between the, the the front half of the year. Well, look, you look at uh, you look at uh, let's start with Roger. You get kind of an incomplete. Right. I mean, it's kind of yes, a great started and then it all he started out. He's had his injury. And uh, so that's his 2020 is kind of a bit of a head scratcher. Played uh, six matches, I believe. Right. Gets to the semis in Australia. So uh, Novak, though, still pretty good. Two major finals, two major finals. I mean, winning his his a Australian and then, uh, you know, the the. The Roland Garros thing is just going to be, I mean, we're looking at that now and we're going to look back and say, wow, this is unbelievable how this guy, I mean, do you realize someone in the future may win Roland Garros six times? Yeah, that's half as many as Nadal won. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Um, and then Rafa, you know, I think, I think Novak and Rafa kind of each met their appointed rounds, didn't they? They each, they each kind of did the things that they usually kind of, do and then each of them left their own question marks around the US Open. One guy who who didn't play it, <laughs> another guy who who left. It's kind of like that's kind of head scratcher. But I don't know. It's such a such a strange year all around. And I suspect a lot of people in the tennis world and the world are eager to say, okay, 2020. Just can we all just wipe it all off and and move ahead? And then again, we're not even sure what's to come in 21. So I don't know. What do you think, Amy? Well, I got to disagree with you. Like Novak defaulting from a, a Grand Slam is not something that normally happens. I mean, he, he gets a major downgrade on his grades uh, from me for that. He had to go into timeout, um, as my kids <laughs> say. That's right. I'm talking about it here. He got detention. Um, and then, you know, I'm uh, Rafa got a little slap on the wrist from me, too, because he didn't play the U.S. Open and he could have. He could he have. won't let him have that. He took the he took the, the, the option to not even take the class. Do you think he should have just 
take it. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. We, we, I, gonna... I would, I'm a fan of his, like I, I'm a fan of, of Novak's as well. That's why I'm mad at him for what he did. But um, I, I, not much really, because he did go on to win the French open and he did it in grand style and he did it by beating Novak. Um, so my, I know you didn't want to give letter grades, but my grade for Rafa is an A minus for the season. Good job. And my letter grade for Novak, I mean, remember that he did win the Australian Open. However, you almost really don't think of that as 2020 because that was pre-pandemic. Um, but he, he gets high marks for that. And he did win tournaments this year. So I give Novak a B. Wow, a guy wins a major. You're, so you, in your mind, it's almost like he kind of, I'm happy that you did well in the midterm. You did well, you did pretty well in the midterm and maybe the paper, but you didn't really nail it. Wow, well, you know. Oh, he we defaulted have... from a grand well, slam. Mm. I default. think. Go ahead. I think I, I think I know why why he gets a B. And that's because Novak is a 4-0 student. Mm -hmm. He he is a, a high achiever. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this year, it just felt like there were a lot of opportunities lost. That's all. And part of that is Wimbledon not happening, where he would have been a favorite to win there. Um, so uh, you don't you don't mark him down for that. There's nothing he can do. But when you look back on 2020, I think there is a certain sense of, well, it could have been way more for Novak Djokovic than it was, especially given the way he started. He was undefeated. This could have been a Djokovic storm season. Mm -hmm. And instead, it was just your... You know, he, he picks up a slam. He holds kind of his status as the best player in the world off clay. Um, but he he didn't really do anything more than you could expect. And he lost the chance at the U.S. Open. And he well, lost the French pretty badly. And yeah. he lost this tournament, too. So, Amy, is he not your play? So is the guy who 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 won one slam finally and... Uh, and reached another. So is your, does that mean your player of the year is Dominic Team? Minus. Um, boy, it would have been if Team could have pulled out this tournament. Um, no, I, it can't be because he didn't have to play Novak or Rafa to get his slam. I'm sorry. Um, he's still a guy on the rise, though. And I love watching this guy play. I mean, let's see what happens with him. But is your player of the year the beast? No, Rafa's my player of the year. Rafa is your player of yeah. the year. Okay, see, my player of the year would be um, would be Novak based on his achievements. But again, I, I also have a whole I have a whole thing that will take offline sometime about what I even think of grades as even but that's mm -hmm. a different thing. I live in California. I, I got to <laughs> I gotta, I gotta think of that more. The player of the year question. I, I guess I, I haven't really fleshed out my my thoughts on that. But to finish my uh, my critique, not my critique, my my feedback for Nadal, my end of year feedback for Nadal is that, I mean, you have to be thrilled with the way he held serve at Roland Garros. He held it love. That's the analogy for what he did at the French Open. He held it love convincingly. And at his age, uh, that is such an amazing sign uh, for his future. And after skipping the U.S. Open, he got the payoff for it. So I'm not docking him for that. Um, and I just think overall, uh, to stay healthy, to do what he did at the French, I got to give him uh, an A as well. I like I like your letter grades, Amy. Although Thanks. maybe maybe Novak gets a B plus. Yeah. Joel doesn't give grades though. Not so big on grades. Not so big. I'm going to think about this some more. I've, no, taken, I've taken classes without grades before. I'm not. I'm pass not, fail. I'm not, I'm not evaluation grade. No, 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 not pass fail. I don't believe in pass fail grading either. I don't like that either. It's like, you know, I, I want, and I have my idea in my head. I mean, I, I don't know the grades. Do you like weighted GPAs? I don't even know what a weighted GPA is. Do you know. like Montessori? Oh, you mean like, these, <laughs> like the ones who get like, you have like a 5.2 because you, you spent your summer break on the board of directors of Apple or something, you know, or you, you, yeah. you launched your own 501c3. And yeah. No, no, I, I, that stuff gets a little much. Yeah, it's funny. We all have our different eras. You know, I went to a high school where you gave yourself your own grades. Think about that. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think, I don't know. To, but again, to be the, um, the player of the year, I think is Novak. I mean, I think he had the best results. Oh. Just, 
It's like I think the player of the year on the woman's side is Kenan. How can the player of the year, we got to do this in another podcast, but yeah. how can the player of the year be somebody who defaulted from a grand slam? I'll find that for you. Believe me, I'll find that for okay. you. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're okay. going to have some fun. I think, I think through December, as a preview of things to come, we've got a lot of topic chewing to do because we're not going to have a lot matches to talk about. So maybe we can do this. We can answer that question about how could the player of the year be someone who is defaulted from a, from a slam. Hey, sure. Stefan Edberg withdrew from uh, from Australian open final. Not, he wasn't defaulted, but he had to withdraw and he became number one that year. So that that's happened. close Joel, but that's All not right. it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, okay. That's fine. Yeah, Joel, you're right. Tennis politics, um, best of three versus best of five going on and some, you know, general evergreen topics that we've uh, been waiting and, and looking forward Life, to jumping return into. of serve positioning. Yes. We, we got to come up with a whole, we got to come up with a whole, a uh, whole lit wish list of, of different topics, you know, Gisa Lane, all that stuff. <laughs> More to come for now. We're out of time on this. We're not out of time. This is a podcast, uh, but we're going to wrap it up on this episode. <laughs> of three remember we're available on all of your favorite podcast platforms greatly appreciate it if you leave a rating and review on apple Podcasts. remember to like the video leave a comment subscribe on youtube and we will see you next time on the next edition of three